everybody, it's Joe Pryor from the Ladies Working Dog Group. Are you feeling stuck with your gun dog training? Trust me, you're not alone and that's exactly why you need to be here. Every week, we'll bring you the best tips and hacks to make training your gun dog easy peasy. We'll keep it straightforward, no fuss, just actionable guidance that you can put straight to use. So let's get started. Hello and welcome to another episode of Found It, Fetched It. This week I am joined by the amazing LWDG group experts, Claire Denya and Samantha Tony from Taylor, and we are going to be talking all about myth busting around breeds. So let's start off as we always do. How are you both today, ladies? Very well, thank you, Joe. Looking forward to recording another podcast with you. It's another very interesting topic. I'm good, thanks, Joe. How are you? I'm really, really interested to have this conversation with you both because, like, we always hear it and we, you know, like, uh, this breed is going to be this, this breed is going to be this. And they're almost like stereotypes, for want of a word. Um, And I think we're going to start with talking about the sort of conversation that people have when they say labs are born half trained. Do you ladies think, both of you run labs, are they born half trained? Absolutely not. (laughs) They're really not born half trained. Um, I think the thing is, the Labrador has been, for a very long time, been known to be a very biddable, trainable dog, which they are. But I think, we, you know, some of the things we touched on in previous podcasts when we talk about breed disposition, breed traits, genetics, all those sorts of things... Over the years, what I've personally seen is the working line Labrador get hotter and hotter and hotter. So they are taking more effort to train, more consistency in training. They're still biddable and they're still amazing dogs and they still love to train and want to learn. But they certainly don't come and are not born half trained. They're born like any other dog as a puppy with predisposed behaviours and traits that we can either enhance or try our best to harness in the way that's most beneficial to us. And so, yeah, they're not born half trained. I think you've hit the nail on the head there. I think, you know, like you said, Labradors tend to be perceived as being more biddable, much potentially softer natured, whereas you get the Spaniels that are seen as sort of, you know, high as a kite and flying around everywhere at a million miles an hour. And there is, in part, some truth in in that as a basic concept. Um, you know, Spaniels are generally a little bit whizzier than Labradors are, or at least they were in the past. But like Claire's just said, breeds have changed exponentially um, and Labradors are becoming fizzier and potentially Spaniels are becoming even fizzier still. Uh, but they do... They're born with their innate behaviours that we need to nurture. It's not that you can just take a six-month-old Labrador onto a shoot field and expect it to know exactly what to do. We still have to train it exactly as we still have to train a Spaniel. So what do you think it is that is making the breed fizzier? Because, like, I suppose any breed, we are working with long lines, you know. So most registered, well, all kennel club registered dogs labradors should come from the same range of lines so what do you think it is recently is that is making them that little bit busier i think part of it is the fact that it's become very trendy and fashionable to have a working line dog um you see this with a lot of breeds not just with labradors um people say i have a working cocker spaniel i have a working labrador um so they're buying lines that let's say perhaps 20 years ago they wouldn't have been looking down this line if you look at a pedigree and the pedigree's got a lot of red in it that's going to be a hot to trot dog it's a dog that has been bred by people that are breeding field trial winners field trial champions um dogs that have been created and designed to have pace and drive and stamina and potentially maybe don't fit brilliantly into a family household that isn't going to be able to give it the appropriate level of exercise training and mental stimulation that that dog specifically needs. So I think it's that it's become more trendy and more fashionable 
to buy a working line dog as opposed to just looking for a nicely bred Labrador. Because if you go on all these sites like Champ Dogs and things like that, you know, you you can read and it it's comes from field trial champions, works in the field, does this, does that. And your average pet owner might read that and think, wow, this is going to be an amazing quality dog, which it is. But is it the right temperament um, dog for a the average household, first time dog owner household? If you think about it, what you just said, like, it's almost like light bulbs in my head. You, you would definitely think, oh, this is going to be a better quality dog because it's coming from champions. But this isn't coming from champions that, and it's no offense to the show ring, because I know how much hard work goes into it. But like a show dog is winning, has trotted around in triangles, and he's been really calm and really well behaved in the show ring and, and been a very easy to handle dog. That's giving you a show champion. A working champion has been literally a Ferrari, for want of another stereotype. And people probably are getting that very confused, aren't they? They are definitely getting that confused, you know, and it's, you've just said about, you know, show champions and working champions. And, and like Claire said, I think that's where a lot of the, the lineages have potentially merged slightly. You know, you used to have within the Labrador a very definitive show line, working line, trialing line. And then over the years, your trialing line and your working line merged, um, you know, and potentially they haven't come back out as much as they should have done. So, there is a lot of confusion there in what people are getting when they're going out to get their dog. Um, and as Claire said, you know, if, if the pedigree has got a lot of red in it, then if you just want your dog to be largely a family pet, but maybe do two or three days in a year, then you should try and avoid having huge amounts of red in it because you're not going to be able to fulfill its needs as much as it requires. It's almost as if we could do with... I don't even know if it's possible, but it's almost like you could do with another sort of qualification for being a really sensible dog. Like we go, like this dog's got a lot of green in its pedigree, which means it's a calm dog, you know. And it's I know that's never going to happen, but it's like how do we get people to look for a calm, sensible, well-adjusted to life dog rather than like you just said Sam this trialing line highly competitive athlete yeah um I think the thing is when you are researching for your puppy especially if you're looking for a Labrador puppy to be a pet maybe you'd like to do a little bit of gun dog training um just as a hobby to do with your dog as a skill set to train it to give it an outlet um Maybe what you should be looking for is a really nice homebred Labrador dog from nice lines, all health tested, but not be looking down the field trial champion line. You know, I think if you if you see it, and like Sam just said as well, if you look at how much red is in that pedigree, you know you're going to get something high drive. So you only have to look for something with a bit less red in it, and you'll probably get, probably, this isn't a guarantee, going to have maybe a slightly calmer disposition dog and I think it's quite a shame because it's not to say that those dogs with you know those dogs that are bred that way are wrong for a family home but that family home needs to be understanding of that dog's needs and the drive that's behind that dog and its temperament and and what that dog's going to need as an outlet otherwise you are going to have behavioral problems and like we spoke on on previous podcasts you know, a lot of behavioural problems come because the dog's uh, needs are not being met. I think also if you look back to like the certain, the lines and and everything from the breed, it, a lot of them were older, more traditional sort of lines and and the working stock um, has potentially, maybe that line hasn't been continued if that makes sense. So, you know, if if the breeder of a steady, sensible line was breeding 30 years ago, they might not be around any longer. You know, they might not, they might have stopped producing that type of dog. And what's Mm. coming in place with, you know, younger people that are coming into it has become this more fiery, more wired type of Labrador. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I I look like you see it, 
um, and I know probably I was was one of the same is you see a novice come in and they're like oh in my pair degree is this name or this name and you were like oh that's gonna be fun and you like you sort of know there is a mismatch from the start and like we I say about horses all the time you a novice would go on a schoolmaster there is no equivalent of a, a schoolmaster line you know a, a, a line that is been bred for its calmness for its its patience you, and I suppose a little bit like if you're into horses and you want something like that you can say well to start I'll have a cob and then I'll move into an Arab whereas if you want to work with dogs you don't have that like you know the, the easy one to begin with and then oh I'll, I'll have this breed first and then I'll go to that high flying spaniel or that high flying lab there is no like starter safe breed Absolutely, that's exactly right. And I think this is where choosing that first dog for your family home is so important and so imperative. And the thing is, where we've just talked about as well, how this this misconception that Labradors are born half trained, we have to look at what that really means. Is that just meaning that the dog is born quite biddable and eager and willing to learn? They're not born half trained. They don't know how to walk to heel. They don't know what a recall whistle sounds like. So they're re- it, it doesn't even make sense to say that sentence. And I have to say, as a behavioural trainer and a gun dog trainer, some of the behaviours that I see where first-time dog owners have gone out and bought their first dog, and it's, it's a Labrador from field trial lines, it's hot to trot, it's a super dog with so much potential and beautiful, beautiful temperament. But because that dog hasn't been given the right start in rules and boundaries and things like that, and the training to get it off to the right start, these dogs in the wrong hands can be actually super dangerous because they're big and powerful. They don't mean to be dangerous, but they're big and powerful. Um, So if they're jumping up you, they could easily knock a child or an elderly or in fact, me, they could easily knock me over. <laughs> you know, I've almost had my nose broken by an untrained Labrador that has been brought up to me and it's throwing itself around on the lead. Um, so they can't, just because they, as a breed, they're renowned for being biddable, lovable, you know, social dogs, doesn't mean that there isn't an element of concern if they are not trained. Yeah, and I think it's sort of akin to giving your 17-year-old newly passed their driving test a Ferrari. Um, you know, they might have they might have learned how to drive in theory, but they haven't got the knowledge or the required history to be able to control such a powerful vehicle, um, you know, mm. which by essence means they're more likely to unfortunately end up having an accident. Um, and it's like Claire just said, if you've gone and got your Labrador, but actually it's the Labrador equivalent of a Ferrari, you have to know what it needs and what to do with it. So like you said, Joe, you know, if you had potentially your, your first Labrador was one from more steadier, calmer working stock, and then your next Labrador was one from field trialing stock or sort of airing, e- eking up the, the levels, if you like. Um, then you would have better chances of making sure that you're in a position to stop those unwanted behaviours, as Claire discussed just now. I think those well. It's not just the like new people are getting Ferraris. They're getting Ferraris without break. <laughs> like you're just <laughs> thinking, this is like it's, it's a recipe for disaster before we've even started. And like we're talking about myths busting across all the breeds. Same things that we see in, in labs is what we can see in spaniels as well, isn't it? And the difference, I suppose, with a spaniel was, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong to say this, but I'll say it anyway. There was no calm version of the spaniel to begin with. So it's just got hotter and hotter and hotter. I think you need to be a special kind of person to have a spaniel. I think that's, there you go. I've said it. <laughs> um, and I love spaniels. Uh, don't get me wrong. You know, I absolutely adore spaniels, love working with them, love having them. But I do think it takes someone that is, for want of a better description, perhaps slightly unhinged in order to commit to having a spaniel. I genuinely absolutely love spaniels and I train loads of them, loads of them. I, I honestly think 
I probably in a week see more spaniels than I see Labradors in, in all honesty. I see a massive range, but round here, the spaniel is a really popular breed, really popular, especially the cockers, but we do see a lot of springers as well. And I really love training them. I, I adore it. But my choice as my companion in the home and to work for myself is my Labradors. Um, and I think, I always jokingly say to people, if I had a spaniel, I know I would fall over it. I know I would. They're too busy around the feet. That's the problem. It's nothing else that is the thing for me. It's the fact. I think I would end up hurting myself. Well, as one of those unhinged people, Sam. I, I, just... I knew that would set you off. Well, after this morning, I'm, I might tend to agree with you. Yeah, I think because the spaniel has been bred more and more towards sort of competition lines, yes, there are still... Um, spaniels out there that are just bred by gamekeepers and just worked and they're a lot generally a lot steadier and sort of not calmer but more focused on their jobs whereas these trialing lines are bred to look flashy they're bred to be fast paced they're bred to get their noses down um and they're they're little deranged morons once they're out it's, it's as simple as it is but because and no offense claire but because cockers look cute and small and fluffy and lovely they've become so so popular with pet homes because people like the look of them they're cute they're, they're they've got eyes that make you go oh but then people get these things home <laughs> um and they're deranged little things that just want to get their noses down and people haven't really done the adequate research to then understand what makes that dog tick and what makes it drive and how to work with them they just end up with these uncontrollable kites on leads that they haven't got any idea where the right buttons to push are and it goes back a little bit to that ferrari conversation yes you know your fiesta really well i can do this and i can do that but as soon as you're faced with a whole dashboard of buttons that do crazy stuff it's a bit overwhelming i think i think you're spot on gem i think that's exactly it when, when i speak to owners who contact me for the first time and we have a chat about why they bought that doll what was it about the breed so often with the spaniels if it, if it's not for a working home i'm trying to i'm talking about this more on a, a pet home level than a working home working level completely different um working home completely different but for a pet home a lot of the time the reasoning behind getting the, the spaniel over the labrador not that they're the only two comparisons but they're the two we're really talking about because of that saying that labradors are born half trained and don't, and spaniels die half trained something like that isn't it a lot of the time the reasoning behind choosing the spaniel is the looks and the size the looks and the size because they're small um so it fits into what if they believe it will fit into their hat their home nicely because it's small and the looks they like them big floppy furry ears and the fuzzy top knot on the head and all of that sort of thing and so that is the two most typical reasons why they purchase that breed very rarely is it because they researched the breed and decided that they really like the idea of getting a small hunting dog that's going to go absolutely looney tunes on a walk in the woods and they're going to need to train it to hunt and they're going to need to train a stock whistle and a recall you never hear that being the reason why they chose the breed you hear it being because it's small and compact and pretty <laughs> so yeah it's not very often in it, but again we're talking about a pet home here as opposed to somebody that wants to get into the gun dog world with the dog we're just going to interrupt the podcast a little bit because when I introduced everybody, Jem wasn't with us. Jem was a little bit late to the party, and it's not like Jem. She's normally like spot on it, but I feel Jem has a spaniel-related story for this. Is that what's going on, Jem? Yeah, I've had had a bit of a, a drastic morning. Um, I've got a litter of puppies at the moment. Are supposed to be going to their new homes this week, and the one that was supposed to go today decided to remove a collar from its sibling and swallow it in front of me. So yeah, I've been at the vets this morning getting said collar vomited up from the puppy, but he's all fine and he's gone to his new home. <laughs> but that's why I was late and um, yeah, slightly frazzled now. And more evidence of why you shouldn't buy a cock. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, we're talking seconds. I saw this thing hanging from his mouth and went, oh, what have you got? Well, mortified, mortified. Is that a, just a spaniel thing or a lab thing of, if I don't want to give it back to you, I might have a little go swallowing it? 
I think it's just a puppy thing. It's like once something's in your mouth, it's disappeared. We, I mean, they're not at the age that I've taught them about bringing me stuff yet. It's it's a behavioural thing as well, though, isn't it? Because John and I often get called out um, dogs that, um, and it's not necessarily resource guarding, but dogs that will swallow things really, really quickly to stop it being taken from them. Not that that's what your puppy was doing. It's a tiny little puppy. It's completely different. But I remember John... Um, telling me a story about one of the Labradors he went out to see and it was a really 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 um severe case where the dog would find balls and swallow them literally find balls and swallow them and it had so many surgeries that the vet had said that they couldn't do another surgery so if the dog ate another ball it would be game over for this dog but there are actually behavioural things recognised with dogs that swallow things but there you go that might be another podcast for another day Joe. I think puppies they discover a lot of things with their mouth like Jem said you know just happened to have it in his mouth and went oh you know what's this and puppies babies they've all got to learn through trial and error a lot of the time and then our education on top of that as to what they can and can't have. Um, But I do also want to add just a little addendum to what I said earlier. I am wholly including myself in the unhinged Spaniel group. Um, So before anyone thinks I'm having a go at Spaniel learners, I am one. And yes, I consider myself in that that group. I think we should start a whole new saying, which is that like Gendog owners are born sane and leave the world exhausted because like that literally is it you just think this is something that's going to drive me mad but we all love it and I think as much as like we laugh and joke and we go through these things I don't think any of us would well I think we are all really lucky because we have each other in the group and when we have really bad days we can talk it out and the rest of the group says come on you can do this and that's not always the case but I think for the majority of people if you've got a supportive try around you for want of a better word you can get through it i think it's incredibly hard if you are somebody who's ended up with one of these like high speed trialing versions of a breed and you don't know why that dog is acting that way you don't even know because you, we always say it all the time you don't know what you don't know you don't even know that's what you've got you don't even understand pedigree to know that you have bought a champion line or winning line and then you're sitting there thinking I was talking to a girl the other day who said my my working cocker does somersaults backwards as I put his food down and it's like you know what do you do with that you must feel a little bit like you've bought a Tasmanian devil instead of a dog absolutely I think you know it comes into what well, obviously there are things that you can train things that you can put in place so you'd be looking at self-control and steadiness and things but yes I can imagine if you go to put your dog's food on the floor and it's doing backward somersaults you absolutely feel like you've bought something that's got something that's not dog in there. I think it's understanding as well the energy that these dogs have the capability and I don't ask me for science behind it because I really don't know but these dog breeds seem to be able to put incredible amounts of energy into their life for no reason, don't they? They're like, if we could just have one-tenth of their energy, we would get so much more done in a day. And I was talking to another guy the other day and saying, you know, I don't think you could ever outwalk a spaniel because you can take a spaniel out all day, bring them in, they'll go in their beds, you'll get up to have a cup of tea and they're like, ah, and they're like, right, where are we going? And I'm like, you're going back to bed, that's where you're going. But like, how do you think that, you know, these these sort of like myths have come around from the fact these versions of these dogs are so incredibly driven, aren't they? I think the myth has purely come around from the fact that everyone seems to think that Labradors are much more steady and maybe they were once upon a time. Um, but as I'm sure these other guys have said before I came on, that the same thing has happened with the labs, that they've made them more hot faster quicker driven so they're probably on a par with the crazy spaniels at the moment because they've got the same drive and the same need to do that thing that they've been bred for that's probably where it originated um, but it's not true anymore yeah so i i agree with everything jem just said about that and i think the thing is sometimes i jokingly say to a client i'll say Your Labrador thinks it's a Spaniel. They have the hunt drive of a Spaniel, the speed, the style. 
And then you get other Labradors that are not like that. But equally, I see plenty of Spaniels that don't have the same hunt drive that the more, and if, if we sort of say the more sort of field trial lines have, so you, you do see that dip in and out, that dip in and out between breeds and not just with Labradors and Spaniels, but with all breeds, you absolutely see dips in and out. I see some HPRs that, you know, really chilled, relaxed and others that are far more wired um, and driven dogs. So I just think, you know, I think the days are gone when you could say a Labrador was like this and a Spaniel was like that. I think the day we have now, the times we're in, it's you need to research the line within that breed to know what you're going to get much better. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's every dog is unique. We've said it before and we'll say it again. So you do have to consider that not only when you're looking into the breed and then into the lineages within that breed, you've also got to understand that just because your puppy comes from a line that always did X, Y and Z, your puppy might not which goes into what Claire was saying about sort of dips in and dips out. You might find that your puppy is the laziest puppy in the litter and doesn't have as much drive as all of his siblings. That doesn't mean he's any less of a puppy. It means he's got his own mind and he is his own person. Um, you know, you can't look at collies and say that every single collie is going to be driven to be a livestock dog. Some of them might be more suited to a slightly calmer home away from livestock. Um so it's definitely looking into various different or looking at it from various different viewpoints. But I think also, I don't know about you guys, but back when the saying Labradors are born half trained and Spaniels leave the world half trained was a real common thing. And at that point had some truth behind it. I think also a lot of people that maybe they grew up as Spaniel people, but then they reached a certain age and they went, you know, what? I think I might need to get a Labrador as my next dog. I don't know that I'm quick enough now to cope with a Spaniel. I think that's changed as well, because I think, you know, a lot of people that potentially would have made the change from Spaniels to Labradors in order to get that calmer dog as they got older now wouldn't get any calmer a dog just by changing breeds. Ladies, what do you think? Definitely. I mean, as, as I said, the, the labs can be just as or even more tapped than a Spaniel and it does vary dog to dog. I think even going back sort of, I don't know, a generation ago, the dogs that were working were probably much truer to the breed standard of both dogs. So they were the heavier set labs. They were the proper sort of almost chunkier cockers that resembled a bit more of a show cocker than a, a working cocker. And it's only what we have done as people that use them and go, actually, I really like that speedy little dog that's worked the ground really well or it's done x y and z we've bred almost two entire new breeds so we've got the working cocker and the working line lab that aren't anywhere near what the breed standard is for the kennel club so it's almost a farce that they get registered as that breed because they if you look at a, a working cocker compared to what the kennel club say a cocker is it's nothing like it other than the fact that it's got a merry movement and it's got a happy bottom or whatever they say. So, yeah, I think I think that's got a big part to play in it as well, how they've evolved so much from what they used to be because of those traits that we like in the dogs and we've carried on breeding them. I agree with everything you both just said. I really, really do. I will just say that I would be incredibly surprised if John doesn't end up getting a Spaniel at some point incredibly surprised he loves them I love them and I love training them but he really loves them so he might go against the grain Sam he might go against the grain and get older and decide he wants one <laughs> and we'll see how that pans out for him bearing in mind he's already 50 so you know <laughs> when he comes to that realization <laughs> he's gonna go against the grain but I would be and I would not stop him but we did actually both agree a couple of years ago when we did seriously talk about getting a spaniel that we actually wouldn't do it in Indy's lifetime it would be her worst nightmare she's 12 in May and for her she you know she she is you know such a serious you know Labrador about life like for her living with a spaniel would probably be just far too traumatic <laughs> so, so 
yeah so we'll we'll have to watch and see he probably won't listen to this podcast so normally I go listen to his podcast but I'm not going to say that to him about this one because I will then he will then know what I've said and then he'll do the opposite just to prove me wrong (laughs) see I think that just proves how caring you guys are with your dogs you know he's he's gonna go about this the opposite way to the norm because it's in the best interest of your oldest dog. So that's wholly commendable. Do you guys remember a few years, well, more than a few years ago, um, when Cocker Spaniels became really, really small? And they went, um, so my, one of my late Cockers was absolutely massive. And I remember all of a sudden having a run of people coming for lessons with these tiny, tiny Cocker Spaniels that never really grew any bigger than a, a, a male pheasant out on a shoot day um I didn't want to call it his real name because I think that might make this explicit um so a, a male pheasant out on a shoot day <laughs> but I think the trouble with that was in order to work the full shoot day with this little tiny tiny cocker although they had the de- determination and a lot of stamina and a lot of speed and a lot of drive you kind of needed 12 of them in order to fulfill the needs for a shoot day whereas the more stockier traditional cocker spaniels before that and slightly what's coming back a bit now are much more able to sort of keep going throughout the whole day does that make sense yeah but i think that's across the board as well because like you know jen when you were saying about evolutions of breed standards i don't even know if the kennel club updates this breed standard things right but they are very different now across the board on all the three breeds we're talking about and probably in other minority breeds as well, you're seeing changes. They just don't update that, so people don't know what they're looking for. Like, and I, I, like you said, we're a Mary Bottom. I don't even know if that's actually in there, but like that's just like a really nice way of saying the dog doesn't sit still. Um, but I also think like things like spaniels. I was at a friend's house on the weekend, and they were. Um, I think he's over ten, maybe twelve. I might be wrong on the name, but he's he's, he's an old boy, and the, he's a. He's a spaniel, an English spring spaniel, and he's got quite long legs, and he's a big, stocky boy, and he's a beautiful old boy. And I can remember my dad having a similar type of spaniel. And then I look what just what my dad bred, and I look at Ella, and she's small. She's like you you could probably say she's probably cocker size or the old cocker size. Just like we it's like almost like honey, I shrunk the dog breed. They're all like getting littler and littler. But is that then changing? what their capabilities are but also how they go into cope in different environments i mean like sam said some of the little tiny cockers although they will try their little hearts out and pick up a a male pheasant it's not sustainable for the whole day because they're using a lot of energy to get that pheasant off the ground and bring it back by making them smaller and smaller and smaller we are limiting their their use in work and i'm sure claire will say the same about labradors as well that they've got a lot smaller and more whippet like haven't they in their sort of shape and the springers like you say joe have got smaller and smaller and smaller it used to be that springers and cockers were the same breed and they were only split because of size so i think it was under 10 kilos i could be wrong under 10 kilos became cockers and over 10 kilos became springers but they were a lot bigger um the springers and my housemate was recently just bought a springer and she was adamant that she wanted a proper in inverted commas springer that was a big bigger bigger dog so she had a real hard time finding one that came from those lines yeah we have seen it in the labrador lines as well and one of the things that i love about my my labs the breeder they're bred from they still have that very traditional labrador head um you see with a lot of the field trial lines now no not a lot some of the field trial lines now um the heads have got snipier smaller thinner um like really really petite and um you know the girls should look like girls you know um indy is is more petite rose is a little taller and rose certainly has a much more traditional labrador head maybe than indies um dude's like a proper labrador isn't he you know but i've even had people say to me he's dude crossed with a rottweiler because of his head and i'm like oh, that's a traditional labrador head it's a nice big square male head so although you wouldn't want the girls to look like that um you do see more male 
um, Labradors now that look like girls. Like sometimes I, I see them, I think, flipping neck, that really looks like, like a girl. Um, and it's a boy. You can only tell by the underneath the difference, not from the top. <laughs> well, before we take this podcast down a completely different, explicit way of checking the underneath of our dogs. <laughs> So thank you, ladies, for another fabulous podcast. I think we've gone around myth busting. And as always, we come back to the uh, our tried and trusted sayings of train the dog in front of you. Every dog is different. And to have an understanding of the breed, if you can, before you go down the, the, the route of buying it. And if you didn't and you haven't, don't worry, we're uh, we're here to help you put it all right. So thank you all, ladies, for a lovely morning's podcast. We hope everyone's enjoyed listening. Please subscribe, please like, share, please tell us what you think. It's really nice to have feedback. Tell us what you want us to talk about as well. We've got 2024 to plan, and I'm sure we can yabber on for days about many, many topics, but we like to cover the topics you love too. So hopefully have a fantastic week, and we shall see you all next week. That's it for today's episode. A massive thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to head over to the LWDG and sign up for our membership. Get access to expert-led training, a wonderfully supportive community, and the resources you need to become a confident and skilled gun dog trainer. Let's take this journey together, because no woman should have to train her gun dog alone. We'll see you all next week. Thank you.